something that I found is the most common denominator of the most successful people I've ever known. It, it, intelligence, I love wickedly intelligent people. You're obviously wickedly smart, and so is your husband, but there are a lot of people wickedly smart that never maximize because they don't have that sense of urgency or a sense of a purpose or a meaning larger than themselves. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, because I also work door-to-door -door sales. I didn't know that <laughs> about you. Tell me what you got out of door-to-door -door sales that became, helped you to succeed in business if something did. Like, what were some of the distinctions or experiences that helped to make you successful as a business person and as an entrepreneur? Whoa. Well, first of all, it's super humbling. Yes. It's really intense. Like I said, I did it for seven years in a, in a company. I was in an office equipment company where most people People, you know, kind of rotated out every four to six months. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the things that it taught me, it taught me the importance of differentiating myself. It taught me uh, about what's in it for me. We'd talk about it, W-I-I-F-M, that when you get a moment with someone, they're looking for the what's in it for them. And I learned I need to deliver that in my message very quickly or I lose them. Yes. You know? So it wasn't like, hey, I'm selling a fax machine. It was like, hey, I really believe I can improve your life and improve the quality of what you're doing because a business just like yours, you know, I, I made it about them. Yes. Um, and it's, as soon as you can give them the benefit, do it. Uh, I used humor and the importance of humor. And you continue to do that as part of your marketing. Yeah, your it's just not taking myself too seriously and, and being vulnerable. I think when you're vulnerable, uh, oftentimes life will surprise you and people will be much kinder to you and much more willing to give you a, a few moments. But a lot of people think of vulnerability as weakness, uh, and I don't. I agree I, with you 100%. I think it's a big strength. Yeah. So sometimes I would walk in a door and be like, uh, you know, Okay, I just messed up. Can I can I redo that? You know, and I'd walk out and come back in, and they'd be like, "What's going on with this girl?" You know, uh, but I was always kind of calling out my own, like, "I'm really nervous right now," or you yeah. know, authentic. This is my fifteenth call, and it's really hot outside. And you know, do you mind if I get a sip of water? And you know, things like that that yes. would help open the door. So, and then when you're doing this really intense selling all day, every day, cold you learn that there's about four different personality types that you're selling to. What are they? And one is always going to click with you because it's your personality yeah. type. But if you want to improve your closing ratio, you got to kind of figure out the other three types. And they're called lots of different things. When I was in sales and really um, training it also, we called them socializers, relators, directors, and thinkers. Yes. And like, for example, I'm more of a socializer director and selling to a thinker was my hardest sale because thinkers want every piece of data and information, whether they're going to use it or not. And I'm like, this is a waste of time, yeah. you know? And I kept losing sales to thinkers. And then finally I was like, I got I to gotta talk to them the way they want to be talked to. Yes. So here's every detail and here it is. And, yes. you know, instead of projecting my style that yes. I liked on yes. them. Yes. Many of you know the DISC model. You've used the DISC model. The S and the C would be more the thinker, right? The director would be the yeah. D. The I would be that social person. So you can translate many of you based on something you already understand. But the inability to adapt makes people fail. And so you, yeah. you learned. You kept adapting seven years of it. Tell me about the role your father has played in your life. You told us one of the most important ones, how he got you to realize you could control and direct your own thinking. But let's talk about the failure thing you shared with me. Is that accurate? Is my memory yes, accurate? Yes, that is accurate. My dad growing up would actually encourage me to fail. So I would come home from school and he would say to my brother and me, so what'd you guys fail at this week? And if I didn't have something, he would actually be disappointed. So, you know, it flipped the whole model on its head and I would come home from school and I can remember, I'd be like, dad, dad, I tried out for this and I was horrible. And he'd be like, way to go. And he'd <laughs> high five me. And I didn't realize it at the time, but he was just um, changing my definition of failure. Yes. My definition of failure became not about the outcome, but about not trying. Mm. And so for me, going through life, my only failures are when I didn't try it because mm. I was scared. Yeah. And my dad even took it a step further. He would ask us what we got, what the benefit or what positive of came from it. Oh, that's great. So we'd be at the dinner table and I'd be like, you know, I failed it. I tried out for cheerleading and I was horrible or I, I had tried for chorus. I couldn't sing at all. Um, but then he'd always go, well, what, what positive came from it? And it trained our brains also to find that. And then it became like, of course I want to try these things because it's you're not learning. so, right. You're not so focused on the outcome. I met my best friend in cheerleading tryouts. Had I not done that, you know, so you, you see these moments 
of, of that, what you get out of it too, that was really cool. How incredible for all of us as a parent to be able to deliver that. I've shared with some of you the greatest basketball coach of all time from UCLA, John Wooden, when I interviewed him and asked him, you know, what was the best team that you had? He won 10 out of 12 national championships and they were all new players. And if you know basketball history, almost everybody know the best team. It was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, a group of people. And he didn't name that team. And he named a team I'd never heard of. And I said, why were they the best? He said, because they maximized their potential. Wow. He said, the other guys had more talent. And he also teaches players. He said, I didn't want to teach them to play the game. I wanted them to play great human beings. And so his goal was, he said, you never know the score. You never know whether you won or lost by the score. Because sometimes you'll get lucky. Sometimes the ball will drop for you or you'll get a good call. Something will go your way and you'll have a higher score, but you didn't really win. And sometimes somebody else's higher score, they got lucky or they got a bad call against you. He said, the only way you know you won is you left everything on that floor every moment you were there. Yeah. You gave your all. He said, then you know whether you won or lost and you're in control of that. And your father taught you to come up with meanings in such a beautiful way. What an amazing shape. Is he still alive today? Yes. Oh my gosh, he must be so proud of you. He is. It's really cool. He's that's, very proud of me. That's awesome. <laughs> well, we honor um, your dad. Yeah, and my mom. My mom was yes. amazing. Tell us you. about your mom. My mom is an artist. She was a stay-at-home mother. She's very shy. She's very, um, just very creative. And um, it was an interesting balance, the yeah. two of them. You know, yeah. I had like a trial attorney that was a litigator that I basically was on the witness stand since birth, you know? <laughs> I had to learn to be quick on my feet, you know? Yes. I did. And then my mom was just this most unbelievable nurturer. Wow. Like just, you know, she was the like, warm blanket through the whole thing, like who I could lean on at any moment wow. that was there. But, you know, I want to talk briefly about failure a little bit more because you talk about it so much in, in all the years that I've been listening to you too. But wh when I like to think about, because you mentioned this, that it's the number one fear is yes. fear of failure. Yes. And so I like to take things a step further. I'm always like, why, 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 till I get to the very last why I can get because that's really where the truth always is. Yes. And so why is our, as human beings, the biggest fear failure? Well, it's because we don't want to be embarrassed, yes. right? So it's really ultimately fear of embarrassment, yes. which then led me to fear of what other people think of me is the real root of the issue. So that is where I spent a lot of time working myself mm. too. Mm. I've been a student of that for, for since I'm 16, I've been working on not caring what other people think about me. And it took me a minute, but I, I realized that not caring what other people think about me doesn't have to mean I don't care about them, mm. which is a big, important thing to uh, recognize. But, um, you know, so, and I, I will practice embarrassing myself, Tony. I intentionally in, in embarrass what way? myself. In what way? I mean, I'll randomly just start singing in an elevator. <laughs> or, and it's super embarrassing and everyone looks at me like I'm crazy or, you know, I just, if I, I notice, I, I will feel if it's been too long since I've been really mortally embarrassed and then wow. I will do it because if you're seeking it, it loses its power over you, you know, then all of a sudden it's like, well, being embarrassed is the goal. And what I also realized by being embarrassed over and over again it makes a great story. I mean, a lot of people will get embarrassed and then the worst thing to do is be like, I hope no one saw that. I hope, you know, I never want to talk about that again or whatever. I'm like, hey guys, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And I realize it's one of the best ways to connect with other humans. Yes. So they're gifts. I'm like, every time I'm embarrassed, it's such a gift. What can I do with that? How important would you say psychology has been in this woman's path? Strong psychology and mindset. I it's mean, like... it's kind of everything, Tony, because I've never taken a business class in my life. Yes. I had no contacts in the industry, and I took on billion-dollar companies with $5,000. So I would say mindset's pretty much it. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. But what, what I'm really touched by is you've not stopped growing, right? Your company hasn't stopped growing over 20 years. You continue to grow. But you keep growing, you keep growing, and she keeps knowing, she keeps conditioning and training, like the training never stops in her mindset. She could easily say, well, I've done these pieces, I know what to do, but you continue to do it. Plus, what the beautiful thing is, it breaks down barriers, because most people would be intimidated if they think you're some way, and when you can just be natural and, and open, and you share something you're truly embarrassed by, it certainly opens the door. Tell us I just thought of a really embarrassing moment in my business journey. Can I share it? Sure, please. Okay. <laughs> When I was first starting Spanx, um, I had 
you know, cold called all the department stores and been on some media here. And I decided to go over to the UK and try to launch Spanx there. And I got this moment where I got a chance to be on the BBC. And it's obviously kind of like Europe CNN. And the guy interviewing me was like, so Sarah, tell us what Spanx can do for women in the UK. And I was like, well, it's all about the fanny. It snooze your fanny. <laughs> It lifts your fanny, okay? I, I had no idea, but apparently fanny means vagina in England. I made, I made the same mistake. You did? I said, get off your fannies, and I got the list. <laughs> no way, did you really? I did. Oh my God, see, I don't even ever use the word fanny, but I thought it sounded very British, so I was like, it makes your fanny look smooth, and the guy like, like lost all the color in his face. He was just like... I had to call back my team of two in my apartment in Atlanta, and I was like, our international expansion is off to a great start. I just told all of England I'm a smoother vaginas. <laughs> Give her a hand. <laughs> Might happen in Australia so the first funny. time. That is so funny. Yeah, I was in Australia so doing a seminar, and I said, get up off your fanny. And I got these looks like, and finally somebody whispered in my ear what I meant, so... <laughs> That is hilarious. Yeah, Get yeah. up off your vagina. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's basically what you said to them. Oh That's hilarious. God. I've never met anyone else that made that hilarious, embarrassing <laughs> well, moment. Okay. Share embarrassing yes, moments. There you go.